I totally <laughs> spilled my coffee as I was taking a drink. All right, chapter 10. No, you should have done that already. You can make it through reading. Chapter 10. Mama made me a cap out of my first coon hide. I was as proud of it as Papa would have been if someone had given him a dozen Missouri mules. Mama said afterwards that she wished she hadn't made it for me because in some way, wearing that cap must have affected my mind. I went coon crazy. I was out after ringtails every night. About the only time I didn't go hunting was when the weather was bad. And even then, Mama all but had to hog tie me. What wonderful nights they were running like a deer through the thick timber of the bottoms, tearing my way through stands of wild cane, climbing over drifts and jumping logs, running, screaming and yelling, woo wee, get him boy, get him. Following the voices of my little hounds. It wasn't too hard for a smart old coon to fool old Dan, but there were none that prowled the riverbanks that could fool my little Anne. Yeah, she's got the brains. She got the brains. As grandpa had predicted, the price of coon skins jumped sky high. A good size hide was worth from four to ten dollars, depending on the grade and quality. Now remember, four to ten dollars doesn't sound like much to us, but that's probably what, fifty to a hundred back then. Okay, Lily. You found figurative language. What'd you find? The price of coon skins jumped sky high. Oh. The price of coon skins jumped sky high. What kind of figurative language is that? Um, metaphor. Personification. Hyperbole. Hi, I like hyperbole. Why would it be a hyperbole? Because it's saying like sky high, like as high as like the tips of the sky, but that's, that's impossible. Right. Because so, uh, a huge exaggeration. It's, uh, wait. Also, I'll take personification. Can coonskins jump? No, no, it's another price. There's another one too. Can, uh, can a price? I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Okay. Jason. Woo wee as an onomatopoeia. Woo wee, onomatopoeia. I'll take that. All right, Riley. Woo Where's a simile? It said he was running like a deer. Running like a deer. Okay. All right. Zeke Moore. I don't have another. What is it called? Figure it but his dogs had a perfect feel, the brain and the brawn. The brain and the brawn of his dogs, yep. Um, okay. I kept the side of our smokehouse plastered with hides. Of course, I would spread them out a little to cover more space. I always stretched them on the side facing the road, mm -hmm. never on the back side. I wanted everyone in the country to see them. The money earned from my furs was turned over to my father. I didn't care about it. I had what I wanted, my dogs. I suppose that Papa was saving it for something because I never saw anything new turn up around our home. But like any young boy, I wasn't bothered by it and I asked no questions. My whole life was wrapped up in my dogs. Everywhere I went, they went along. There was only one place I didn't want them to go with me and that was to Grandpa's store. Other dogs were always there and it seemed like they all wanted to jump on old Dan. Poor it got God. so about the only time I went to see my grandfather was when I had a bundle of fur to take to the store. This was always a problem. In every way I could, I would try to slip away from my dogs. Sometimes I swore that they could read my mind. It made no difference what I tried. I couldn't fool them. One time I was sure I had outsmarted them. The day before I was to make one of my trips, I took my furs out to the barn and hid them. The next morning I hung around the house for a while and then nonchalantly whistled my way out to the barn. I climbed up in the loft and peeked through a crack. I could see them lying in front of their doghouse. They weren't even looking my way. Taking my furs, I sneaked out through a back door and walking like a tomcat. Fiona. Simile. Walking like a tomcat. Why would the author use a simile here, walking like a tomcat? What does that add to the story? Jason. The, it's adding description of how he's walking. Right, it's given us a description. Does it help you picture in your mind how sneaky and soft he's trying to walk? If I knew what it was, what a tomcat was, yes. If you knew what a tomcat was, a tomcat's like a wildcat. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. like a not it, a house cat. What does it look like? It's just a regular cat. Yeah. Like not a not a pet. Huh. 
It's probably going to show me a tractor. Just Yeah, it's just like a common cat. But that's out in the wild. Wait, do the one laying down. Do the one laying down. This guy? He's so cute. All right, just in case anybody else needed to see what a tomcat looks like. It's amazing. Yeah, that's not a house cat. Yeah, that, but it could have just walked inside like people. Yeah, these are not necessarily tomcat. And that looks like it was a tomcat until I brought it in his house because it looks a little mangy. All right, anyway. All right. All right, I made it to the timber. I climbed. I climbed a small dogwood tree and looked back. They were still there and didn't seem to know what I'd done. Feeling just about as smart as Sherlock Holmes. Ooh. Maggie. That's a simile. That's a simile. As smart as Sherlock Holmes, I headed for the store. I was walking along, singing my lungs out. Singing, oh, that's another. Uh, First song, features. Wait, that's uh, hyperbole. hyperbole. Can you actually sing your lungs out? No. No, he is crazy exaggerating. There is a ton of figurative language here. All right, here we go. When they came tearing out of the underbrush, wiggling and twisting and tickled to death to be with me. Uh, to death. To death. Were they actually dying? No. Hyperbole again. All right. Are all of these figurative language things helping us picture a more... No vivid image in our mind yeah. right they should be yeah. um if he was just like i felt smart i went to the store i sang and my dogs followed me would that's right? stupid right if i took all the figurative language out that would that's be what that stupid, sentence right? was like so far okay at first i was mad but one look at dancing little ann and all was forgiven I sat down on my bundle of fur and laughed till I hurt all over. I could scold them a little bit, but I could no more have whipped one of them than I could have kissed a girl. After all, a boy doesn't just whip his dogs. My grandpa always counted my furs carefully and marked something down on a piece of paper. I'd never seen him do this with the other hunters, and it got the best of my curiosity. One day while he was writing, I asked him, why do you do that, grandpa? He looked at me over his glasses and said kind of sharp, never mind, I have my reasons. When Grandpa talked to me like that, I didn't push things any farther. Besides, it didn't make any difference to me if he marked on every piece of paper in the store. I always managed to make my trips on Saturdays, as that was Coon Hunter's Day. I didn't have to stand around on the outside of the circle anymore and listen to the Coon Hunters. I'd get right up in the middle and say my piece with the rest of them. I didn't have to tell any whoppers, for some of the things my dogs did were almost unbelievable anyhow. Oh, I guess I did make things a little bigger than they actually were. But I never did figure a coon hunter told honest to goodness lies. He just kind of stretched things a little. I could hold those coon hunters spellbound with some of my hunting tales. Grandpa would never say anything while I was telling my stories. He just puttered around the store with a silly little grin on his face. Once in a while, when I got too far off the beaten path, he would come around and cram a bar of soap in my pocket. My face would get all red. I'd cut my story short, fly out the door, and head for home. Why would Papa kind of smile to himself some of the times when he was telling a story and others, he kind of tried to put him in his place and be like, mm -hmm. too much. Sean's raising his hand. Sean's raising his hand? No, he's not. Reading the head. No. Um, Cam, what do you think? Because Grandpa knows that some of those stories aren't real and sometimes he just lets him do his thing, just go on, and then sometimes whenever he gets a little bit too far fetched, he'll put a bar of soap in his pocket and go, hey, if you go way too far, I'm going to wash your mouth out with this. There you go. That's exactly, there's some symbolism there that the bar of soap, um, that's an old timey thing, but has that ever happened to any of you? Your parents ever threatened or washed mouth out with soap? Have you heard that before? Yeah. Never even heard it before? I heard it. I used If you talk like kind of back in the day, like if you're talking bad, like saying bad words, telling lies, obviously your mouth is dirty. You need to clean it up. So they'd say they wash your mouth out with soap. And sometimes they really mm -hmm. did back in the day. As yeah. Sean's like, yes, it's happened. Yeah, I, it's no good. Okay. Josie says once. Whoa, Josie was bad enough to get soap. 
I was four. Sassy Josie, I can't even imagine it. Um, Lily, have I ever got my mouth washed out with soap? Yes. You know my sassy mouth done has. Like, yeah. come on now. I was I wasn't a rotten. I was a good kid, but I yeah, talked, good kid I'm just like all y'all. I talked nonstop. I was running my mouth. Yeah, all you were a good kid that threw rocks at cars. A good kid that threw sticks, not rocks. Sticks. You said anything you could find. It was sticks. That did. The sticks. Uh, yeah. Sophie. So I have a little cousin named Sawyer, and he's about five years old now. But I remember this one little time he was being annoying and being rude to my little sister Stella. She was about three months old. And now she's like five years old, something like that. But um, he was being really rude to her. To her uncle Sam came and picked, picked him up and took him to the bathroom. And I'm like, oh no. I know. Yep. DJ. The one time that's ever been said to me was my babysitter said it to me one time. Your babysitter said it to you one time? Yeah. You can get you. Getting sassy with the sitter. Maggie. Uh, my little brother and my older brother got their mouth washed out because they uh, were saying things they shouldn't be saying. And me, I'm just like, sucks to be you. And I just go to my room like, I don't know. There you no, go. No. Yeah, Maggie's brother's got it. Mace. Yeah. Okay, this is recent. Yeah. Recent? All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm there. Okay, yeah. So I'm listening I to Mace. This it was a and so, you know how there's a soap and it looks like a cupcake thing. All right, and a I soap that's know. like shaped like a cupcake. Okay, yeah. I didn't know it was a soap. And, and Macy soap. didn't know, realize it was soap. It was a very convincing soap. And it's not really good, so I licked it. Yeah. And she went to look the icing, and it was it so. It was terrible. She said it was recent too. It was. This is bad. <laughs> Zeke. How so, would you? Um, yeah, I've had soap on my mouth before when I was younger. It hasn't happened in a while. But then, on um, one time, I got Tabasco sauce on my mouth, and it was bad. Oh, that's Tabasco yeah, sauce? Yeah, that'll burn. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Here we go. The coon hunters were always kidding me about my dogs. Some of the remarks I heard made me fighting mad. I never saw hounds so small, but I guess they are hounds. At least they look like it. I don't believe little Anne is half as smart as she says she is. As she's, he, as he says. says she is. She's so little, those old dudes think she's a rabbit. I bet she sneaks right up on them before they realize she's a dog. Some of these nights, a big old coon is going to carry her off to his den and raise some little coon puppies. Okay, so these are some of the things that the other hunters are saying about his dogs. Okay. Um, all right. I always took their kitten with a smile on my face, but it made my blood boil like the water in Mama's tea kettle. Uh, hyperbole? I mean simile. Simile, like, like the water in Mama's tea kettle. I had one way of shutting them all up. Let's all go in the store, I'd say, and see who has the most hides in there. Ooh. It was true that my dogs were small, especially little Ann. She could walk under any ordinary hound. In fact, she was a regular midget. If it had not been for her long ears, no one could have told that she was a hound. Her actions weren't those of a hunting hound. She was constantly playing. She would play with our chickens and young calves with a piece of paper or a corn cob. What my little girl lacked in size, she made up for in sweetness. She could make friends with a tomcat. Old Dan, just the opposite. He strutted around with a belligerent and tough attitude. Belligerent. What does belligerent mean? Oh, uh, uh, mean Um, Aggressive? Mean, aggressive. What do you think, DJ? I would say more of like... He's like walking around like acting like he's better, like he's like, like spreading around like. Like he's better than them, yeah. okay? Um, is that one of our vocab? Words? It is one of the vocab words for today. Belligerent. Um, when I think of belligerent, proud or trying to show off. Um, yeah, it's kind of what DJ was saying. More of like defiant. Um, belligerent is more like you're being defiant about something. Like if your parents tell you to do something. And you're like, I don't want to do that. And they're like, I told you to go make your bed. And you're like, I'm just going to go get in it later. 
Like, and you just I keep know. talking back and you just keep on, keep on, keep on arguing. That's, why I don't get so That's being around. belligerent. You're just arguing for the sake of arguing. You know that you're eventually going to go make that bed because your parents are going to lose their mind. Oh, you. But you're just arguing for the sake of arguing. You're being defiant. Ms. That's Ms. kind of belligerent. Ms. Let's that, look up Ms. the Ms. actual that definition. That reminds though. me of that TikTok I told you about. Well, that boy, he told his mom, oh, where his mom said, go clean your room. He said, but it's my room. The mom said, but it's my house. And he said, go clean oh. it. Yeah. All right, hang on. Oh, my brother said that to my mom a few days ago. Oh, really? He, he All right. So Belligerent, hostile, Ooh. and aggressive. Um, that guy got punched in the face. This guy <laughs> is um, <laughs> belligerent. <laughs> He looks angry. Is that All right. is that Josie, yes ma'am. Please. I'm just gonna say, um, with the last time we talked, if if I was in the classroom, I would be very different. I'm a very talkative person. And I don't know if if you knew that, but I mean I would be very different. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. All right. He had a belligerent and tough attitude. Although he wasn't a tall dog, he was heavy. His body was long and his chest broad and thick. His legs were short, big, and solid. The muscles in his body were hard and knotty. When he walked, they would twist and jerk under the skin. He was a friendly dog. There were no strangers to him. He loved everyone, yet he was a strange dog. He would not hunt with another hound other than little Ann or another hunter, not even my father. The strangest thing about old Dan was that he would not hunt even with me unless little Ann was with him. I found this out on the first night I tried it. Little Ann had cut the pad of her right foot on a sharp, jagged flint rock. It was a nasty cut. I made her a little boot of leather and put it on her wounded foot. To keep her from following me, I locked her in the corn crib. <laughs> Two nights later, I decided to take old Dan hunting for a while. He followed me down to the river bottoms and disappeared in the thick timber. I waited and waited for him to strike a trail. Nothing happened. <clears throat> After about two hours, I called to him. He didn't come. I called and called. Disgusted, I gave up and went home. Coming up through the barn lot, I saw him rolled up in a ball on the ground in front of the corn cop crib. And I immediately corn. understood. I walked over and opened the door. He jumped up in the crib, smelled little Ann's foot, twisted around in the shucks, and lay down by her side. As he looked at me, I read this message as friendly gray eyes. You could have done this a long time ago. I never did know if Lil Ann would hunt by herself or not. I am sure she would have. She was smart and an understanding dog, but I never tried to find out. Lil Ann was like my sister's pet. They rubbed and scratched and petted her. They would take her down to the creek and give her baths. She loved it all. If mama wanted a chicken caught, she would call Lil Ann. She would run the chicken down and hold it with paws until mama came. Not one feather would be harmed. Mama tried old Dan once, but she got before she got the chicken, there wasn't much left but the feathers. By some strange twist of nature, little Ann was destined to go through life without being a mother. Perhaps it was because she was stunted in growth, or maybe because she was the runt in a large litter. That may have had something to do with it. During the first season, November through February, I was given complete freedom from work. Many times when I came home, the sun was high in the sky. After each hunt, I always took care of my dogs. The flint rocks and saw briars were hard on their feet. With a bottle of peroxide and a can of salve, I would doctor their wings. I'm going to back up a paragraph. We vocabulary word. Perhaps it was because she was stunted in growth. Stunted. Lily. Like they're not growing. Not growing, yeah. Her growth has just kind of stopped. It's like your growth is stunned. Kind of like stunned, like it's just, yeah, it's just not happening. It's, it's, it's taking a while. Yeah. It's going by very slow. Okay. Yeah. It's just kind of cut off. All right. There you go. Are we, have we finished the bank chapter? No. I never knew what to expect from old Dan. I never saw a coonhound so determined or one that could get into so many predicaments. More than one time, it would have been the death of him if it hadn't been for smart little Ann. One night, not long after I'd entered the bottoms, my dog struck the trail of an old boar coon. He was a smart old fellow and had a sack full of tricks. He crossed the river time after time. Finally, swimming to the middle and staying in the swift current, he swam downstream. 
Knowing he would have to come out somewhere, my dog split up. Old Dan took the right side. Little Ann worked the other side. I came out of the bottoms onto a gravel bar and stood and watched them in the moonlight. Little Ann worked downriver, and then she came up. I saw her when she passed me going up the bank, sniffing and searching for the trail. She came back to me, and I patted her head, scratched her ears, and talked to her. She kept staring across the river to where old Dan was searching for the trail. She waded in and swam across to help him. I knew that the coon had not come out of the river on her side. If he had, she would have found the trail. I walked up to a riffle, pulled my shoes, and waded across. My dogs worked the riverbank up and down. They circled far out into the bottoms. I could hear the loud snuffing of old Dan. He was bewildered and mad. I was getting a thrill from it all, and I had never seen him fooled like this. Old Dan gave up on his side, piled into the river, and swam across to the side little Ann had worked. I knew that it was useless for him to do that. I was on the point of giving up, calling them to me, and going elsewhere to hunt when I heard the ball of little Ann. I couldn't believe what I heard. She wasn't balling on a trail. She was sounding the tree bark. I hurried down the bank. There was a loud splash. I saw old Dan swimming back. By this time, little Ann was really singing a song. In the bright moonlight, I could see old Dan clearly. His powerful front legs were churning the water. Then I saw a sight that makes a hunter's heart swell with pride. Still swimming, old Dan raised his head high out of the water and bawled. He couldn't wait until he reached the bank to tell little Ann he was coming. From far out in the river, he told her. Reaching the shallows, he plowed out of the river onto a sandbar, not even taking time to shake water from his body. Again, he raised his head and bawled and tore out down the bank. In a trot, I followed, whooping, let them know I was coming. Before I reached the tree, old Dan's deep voice was making the timber shake. The tree was a large birch in and right on the bank of the river. The swift current had eaten away at the footing, causing it to lean. The lower branches of the tree dangled in the water. I saw how the smart old coon had pulled his trick. Coming in toward the bank from midstream, he had caught the dangling limbs and climbed up. Exhausted from the long swim, he stayed there in the birch, thinking he'd outsmarted my dogs. I couldn't understand how little Ann had found him. It was impossible to follow the tree towards the bottoms. It was too much off balance. I did the next best thing. I cut a long elder switch. Unbuckling one of my suspenders, I tied it to the end and climbed the tree. The coon was sitting in a fork of a limb. Taking my switch, I whooped him a good one, and out he came. He sailed out over the river. With a loud splash, he hit the water and swam for the other side. My dogs jumped off the bank after him. They were no match against his expert swimming. On each and the other bank, he ran down river. Climbing down out of the tree, I picked up my axe and lantern and trotted off, trotted down to another riffle and waded across. I could tell by the balling of my dogs they were close to the coon. He'd have to climb a tree or be caught on the ground. All at once, their voices stopped. I stood still and waited for them to ball a tree. Nothing happened. Thinking the coon had taken to the river again, I waited to give them time to reach the opposite bank. I waited and waited. I could hear nothing. By then, I knew he had not crossed over. I thought perhaps they had caught him on the ground. I hurried on. I came to a point where a slough of crystal water ran into the river. Slough. That's our other vocab word today. Oh. Crystal clear water is in. I came to a point where a slough. That's the vocab word. Slough. I thought he saw a slough. Of clear water ran into the river. Okay. DJ, what does slough mean? Like a slough is like a lot. So like you say, I have a slough of books. Look at that guy getting punched. Getting punched. Slough. Oh, I've seen that kind of stuff before. All right, let me show you guys. Decide. Present. Go click on images. Wait. Nope, cancel. I clicked the wrong thing. I was going to say, you clicked the wrong one. Ah! <laughs> All right, so it says a swamp or a lack of progress or activity. So it's kind of like a calm spot. In the river, Wait, can you a slough of crystal clear water. So I would say we're looking at the second definition here. Lack of progress or activity. So lack of activity. So it's kind of like a calm spot well, um, like, and um, where there's pond. clear water pond, um, in the river. So it's like okay. a pond? Not a pond. It's still the river, but it's just like a spot where it's the water's not running very fast. 
Okay. Miss Pat, okay. can you click images? Or Swap see what? is a shiny. What? I, I think that's the name of a town. Yeah, it's a town in England. Okay. Anyway, carrying <laughs> on. Um. All right. On the other side of the river was a bluff. I could hear one of my dogs over there. As I watched and waited, I heard a dog jump in the water. It was little Anne. She oh, yeah. swam across and came up to me. Staying with me for just a second, she jumped in the slop and swam back to the other side. I could hear her sniffing and whining. <coughs> I couldn't figure out where old Dan was. By squatting down and holding the lantern high over my head, I could dimly see the opposite bank. Mm -hmm. Little Anne was running up and down. I noticed she always stayed in one place for a, of about 25 yards, never leaving that small area. She ran down to the water's edge and stared out into the slough. The horrible thought came that old Dan had drowned. I knew a big coon was capable of drowning a dog in water by climbing on his head and forcing him under. As fast as I could run, I circled the slough, climbing up over the bluff, and came down to where little Ann was. She was hysterical, running up and down the bank and whining. I tied my lantern on a long pole, held it out over the water, and looked for old Dan's body. I could see clearly in the clear spring waters, but I couldn't see my dog anywhere. I sat down on the bank, buried my face in my hands, and cried. I was sure he was gone. Several minutes passed, and all that time, little Ann had never stopped. Running here and there along the bank, she kept sniffing and whining. I heard when she started digging. I looked around. She was 10 feet from the water's edge. I got up and went over to her. She was digging in a small hole about the size of a big apple. It was an air hole for a muskrat den. I pulled little Ann away from the hole, knelt down, and put my ear to it. I could hear something and felt a vibration in the ground. It was an eerie sound and seemed to be coming from far away. Yeah. I listened, and finally, I understood what the noise was. It was the voice of old Dan. Little Ann had opened the hole up enough with her digging so his voice could be heard faintly. In some way, he had gotten into that old muskrat, muskrat den. Do you guys know what a muskrat is? Uh, yeah. It's, like it's kind of like a little beaver looking but it thing. Can stand and, it goes and so back. they, yeah. Um, What's a mongoose? All right, muskrat looks like a little beaver thing, except it has a long skinny tail like a rat instead of a beaver. Well, um, and so that they live on the banks just like a oh. beaver does, and they kind of tunnel a little den in the ground up against the river. So they enter their den from the water. And, but then they go up underground and they have like an air hole, if that makes sense. Let me see. Uh, muskrat. muskrat den, let's see here. Okay, so you can see like there's a little tunnel under the water there, but then it probably goes up into a spot that doesn't have water in it. Look at the, look at the um, one at the hollow view. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, this one right here. So they go in from the water, but then they can come up on dry land underneath. Does that so make that's sense? How you got up there. So old Dan was probably in the water and it got pulled in somehow. And so there old little Ann is up top trying to dig down to him. All right. I knew that down under the bank in the water, the entrance to the den could be found. Rolling up my sleeve, I tried to find it with my hand. I had no luck. It was too far down. There was only one thing to do. Leaving my axe and lantern, I ran from home, ran for home. Picking up a long handled, handled shovel, I hurried back. The sun was high in the sky before I had dug old Dan out. He was a sight to see, nothing but mud from the tip of his nose to the end of his tail. I held on to his collar and let him down the river to wash him off. The water there was much warmer than the cold spring water of the sloth. After washing him, I turned him loose. Right back to the hole, he ran. Little Ann was already digging. I knew the coon was still there. Working together, we dug him out. After the coon was killed, I saw what had made him so smart. His right front foot was twisted and shriveled. At one time, he must have been caught in a trap and had pulled himself free. He was an old coon. His face was almost white. He was big and heavy and had beautiful fur. Tired, muddy, wet, and hungry, I started for home. I've often wondered how old Dan got into that muskrat den. Perhaps there was another entrance I had overlooked. I'll never know. One night, far back in the mountains, in a place called the Cyclone Timber, old Dan really pulled a good one. Many years before my time, a terrible cyclone had ripped its way through the mountains. Cyclone's another word for tornado. tornado. Had ripped its way through the mountains, leaving its scar in the form of fallen timber, twisted and snarled. 
The path of the cyclone was several miles wide and several miles long. It was a wonderful place to hunt as it abounded with game. My dogs had struck the trail of a coon about an hour before. They had really been warming him up. I knew it was about time for him to take up a tree. And sure enough, I heard the old voice or the deep voice of old Dan telling the world he had a coon up a tree. I was trotting along going to them when his voice stopped. I could hear little Ann, but not old Dan. I wondered why and was just a little scared for I just knew something had happened. Why then I heard his voice. Him? It seemed louder than it had been before. It felt much better. I felt much better. When I came up to the tree, I thought little Ann had treed old Dan. She was sitting on her haunches, staring up and bawling the tree bark. There, a good 15 feet from the ground, with his hind legs planted firmly in the center of a big limb and his front feet against the trunk of the tree, stood old Dan, bawling for all he was worth. <coughs> Above him, some eight or nine feet, was a baby coon. I was glad it was a young one, for if it had been an old one, he would have jumped out. Old Dan would have fallen, and he surely would have broken all of his legs. From where I was standing, I could see it was impossible for old Dan to have climbed the tree. It was dead and more of an old snag than a tree with limbs that were crooked and twisted. The bark had rotted away and fallen off, leaving the trunk bare and slick as glass. It was a good 10 feet up to the first limb. I couldn't figure out how old Dan had climbed that tree. There had to be a solution somewhere. Yeah. Walking around cool. to the other side, I saw how he had accomplished his feat. There, was a, there in the bottom was a large hole. The old tree was hollow. Stepping back, I looked up and could see another hole which had been hidden from me because of old Dan's body. He had simply crawled into the hole at the bottom, climbed up in the hollow of the tree, and worked his way out on the limb. I want to do that. <laughs> and then, and then in some know. way, he had turned round, reared up, placing his front feet against the trunk. There he was. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't cut the tree down, and I was afraid to climb it for fear I would scare the coon into jumping out. If he did, old Dan would jump too and break his legs. Unless he catches him. I ran plan after plan around in my mind. None would work. I finally came to the conclusion that I had to climb the tree and get a hold of that crazy dog. Yes. I blew out my lantern, pulled off my shoes and socks, and started shimmying up the tree. I prayed that that coon wouldn't jump out. Inching along, being as quiet as I could, I made it up to old Dan and grabbed his collar. I sat down on the limb and held him tight. He would bawl now and then and all but burst my eardrums. I couldn't drop him to the ground, and I couldn't climb down with him. I couldn't sit there on that limb and hold him all night and I'd be no better off when daylight came. Glancing at the hole by my side gave me the solution to my problem, I thought. If he can come out of this hole, he can go back in it. Oh, no. That was the way I got my dog down from the tree. This had its problems, too. In the, old, in the first place, old Dan did not want to be put in the hole head first. By scolding, pushing, shoving, and squeezing, I finally got him started on this way. Like a fool, I sat there on the limb waiting to see him come out at the bottom, and come out he did, Turning around, bawling as he did, right back in the hole he went. Oh, my gosh. I, there was nothing I could do but sit and wait. I understood why his voice had stopped for a while. He just took time out to climb a tree. Putting my ear to the hole, I could hear him coming. Grunting and clawing, up he came. I helped him out of the hole, turned him around, and crammed him back in. That time, I wasn't too gentle with my work. I was tired of sitting on that limb, and my bare feet were getting cold. I started down the same time he did. He beat me down. Looking over my shoulder, I saw him turn around and head back for the hole. Yeah. I wasn't far from the ground, so I let go. The flint rocks didn't feel too good on my feet when I landed. I jumped to the hole just in time to see the tip end of his long tail disappearing. I grabbed it. Holding on with one hand, I worked his legs down with my other and pulled him out. I stopped his tree climbing by cramming rocks and chunks into the hole. How the coon stayed in the tree, I'll never know, but stay he did. With a well-aimed rock, I scared him out. Old Dan satisfied his lust to kill. I started for home. I'd had all the hunting I wanted for that night. That was good. That was good. All right. Lots of figurative language in that chapter. Good I vocab. I didn't see any more. Now we've got chapter no six through ten. No. Quiz. No. Um, Cam. Do we need to do like the worksheet that we do every single day? Or you don't have to do no, the worksheet no, today, no. no, no, no you no. can do just the um, chap quiz. Chap chap okay. Chap so, no, you don't have to do the worksheet for today. All right. I'm going to stop recording, pass out their worksheets. You guys are good to go and start working on your quiz, too.